This is one of um, 29 meetings taking place right across the city. It is to explain to residents the budget review process so that we can take into account the, the views of residents in the preparation of the budget for 2025. Um, so it's the opportunity for us to explain the process, but also for us to hear from you whether you've got particular um, suggestions, requests, complaints. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to my colleague who's, who's prepared. Unfortunately, he was explaining to me there's no power so uh, we, we can't use the overhead projector, unfortunately, but you'll, you'll do your best, sir. I, I would like to welcome you all. My name is Isaac Matare. I'm the finance manager in charge of um, the accounting services in city of Lawayo. We are expecting the financial director to be with us. Oh, yes, he's here. <laughs> all right. So today we are visiting your words, we have been doing this throughout the city uh, in different words. I've had the privilege of going to Mpopo Mawad. I've had the privilege of also attending uh, the Trinens, uh, Queen's Park, Woodville uh, Ward as well. We were sharing with them the same information that we are going to share with you today. Um, we are here to discuss with you, to get your views on how the budget should be crafted for 2025. But what we will start by doing is just going through a review of uh, what we did with the 2024 budget. And what we've done, we've distributed the material that you are having in your hands that's showing what uh, City of Blawayo has uh, done in the first quarter. You'll recall last year we didn't have uh, these outreach meetings because it was an election year. We decided we are not going to go into the wards uh, to, to get your views. So we did just some meetings at City Wall. We invited the whole city to the City Wall to discuss the way forward on the 2024 budget. And so what we then came up with is what we are now discussing with you at the moment. We are looking at what we did in the first quarter. The first quarter is January to March, and then the second quarter is from April to June. So we are sharing with you what council did, what challenges they faced, and then we'll ask, uh, we'll have a plenary session where you will also ask for clarifications on things you might want us to address. If you look at the handout that we are giving you, we are looking at the box right at the bottom on what we achieved during the first quarter. When we started the first quarter, we didn't have a budget. We did the budget for 2024, but the minister decided to approve the budget in March. So it meant that the greater part of the first quarter, we operated with last year's budget, but we were not allowed to embark on any capital projects. Because once the budget is not approved, we cannot embark on any capital projects, but we can continue running the city on recurrent issues. So if there are issues of a capital nature that needed attention in January, February, we couldn't attend to those because the minister had not approved the budget. He approved, approved almost all the budgets in March for all the local authorities. We are 92 local authorities countrywide. I think there were two local authorities whose budgets were not approved. And then because of that delay, we also stopped doing capital projects. Then there was also an issue about the devolution funds. If you read the constitution, it talks about devolution. It talks about devol devolution in terms of power. It also talks about devolution in terms of administration. It also talks about devolution in terms of the monies that the central government is collecting form of taxes, duties, and everything else. And then it has to share that amount with all the uh, country's provinces. City of Lawaii is a beneficiary. We do get devolution funds, but we didn't get any allocation in the first quarter. We didn't get any money from government in terms of devolution funds. 
When you also look at the economy during the first quarter, you recall that we were still in hyperinflation in the first quarter rates. Started, our exchange rates were sitting at 6,000. By the time we converted our currency into ZIG, you remember the exchange rate that was given by the Reserve Bank was sitting at 33,000. We started January at 6,000 something. By the 4th of April, the exchange rates had shot up to 33,000. US uh, Zim dollars to one US dollar. So that inflation was also hitting the council because we had to pay the, the, the brunt of the inflation. As a result, you find a lot of our suppliers were saying we are not interested in getting any payment in the form of Zimbabwean dollars in the first quarter. So they were demanding payments from council for anything that we wanted. All our inputs that we needed, they were now demanding US dollars for everything that council was uh, supposed to use. Then in the second quarter, if you turn your page to the back of that first page, we are saying when we entered the first quarter, our capital expenditure improved a bit. In the first quarter, we we're sitting at 0.2 of the budget, 0.2% of the budget. That's what we spent in the first quarter. When we moved to the second quarter, we were able to spend 30% of that quarter's budget in terms of capital expenditure. But overall, when we look at the total budget for council for 2024, the capital budget, we've just only spent 8% of it. Um, what are the reasons? Some of the reasons we'll share with you as we move. Again, when we look at the second quarter from April right through to June, you will notice that that's when we introduced the ZIG. Um, on the 4th of April, they stopped the Zim dollar. Then we had to convert figures on the 6th of April. We had to start using the ZIG. Uh, that had a serious impact on cancer. I have to be honest with you, because when they did the conventions, people who had Zim dollars during that transition period could not trade, simply because the banks were a bit slow on converting your balances from Zim dollar to uh, ZIG. So there was a lag of about a week or two where people were not trading. You could not go and swipe because the banks were still busy trying to change you from Zim dollar to ZIG. So because of that lag, council also suffered in terms of collections. People were not paying us because they were used to swiping their Zim dollars. Now the ZIG is not yet open for use. It took a while for them to, 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 to get into the pen record. What we noticed after the ZIC was introduced, it seems the inflation sort of came to a standstill. It slowed down. We are told it went down to negative, and then at the moment it's just sitting at almost 0%, um, the inflation, the annual inflation that is there. And then again, it didn't stop suppliers from demanding in the second quarter US dollars. Up to today, they're still demanding council to pay them in US dollars. So you might find certain services that we want to give you because residents are free to pay us in any currency that they choose. We, we don't deny you if you come with a ZIC to our offices, we will accept it. If you come with a US dollar, we'll accept it. But at the moment, the market is demanding US dollars. We won't force you to pay us in US dollars. We will accept whatever you give us. But for us to then go out, I can't go and swipe with a ZIG amount to a supplier. They will demand the US dollar. Now, I'll just take you through some of the vital statistics that are shown on the second page of this presentation. In the first quarter, our revenues started very low in January, um, and they started growing to about 31% of the total for the quarter. And then in March, they grew to 47%. That is the growth we're seeing. This growth is nothing like I'm getting more money. I'm getting more money, which is useless. <laughs> That's why the growth was there. As inflation was hitting, sorry, as the exchange rate was hitting us, people were now dumping even more of these Zim dollars. So we would get a lot of Zim dollars, but all those Zim dollars are meaningless. Because if I were to change them into a staple currency, I was actually going lower and lower. Despite that, the Zim dollars that we're getting were growing. And then on the expenditure side, again, we started very low in January at 20% of the total for the quarter. It grew up to about 
47% towards the end of the first quarter. I'll also move to the second quarter. Again, our collections, they literally fail because people were a little hesitant. I'll share you, with you my experience. On the, the weekend after the zigging, I had to travel to Vic Falls. So I boarded the buses. I didn't want to use my car. You know how Vic Falls Road is. So I decided, let me jump into a bus and go to Wange. There was a waiting I was attending. You know, interestingly, the bus was empty because everyone was not sure how do I pay. And this Zeke that I want to pay the bus operator, will he accept it? I went to Vic Falls on an empty bus. Sorry to Wange on an empty bus. On my return trip, the bus didn't come because there were no customers. They were still figuring out to deal with the Zig that first week of it. So it also meant the same to council, to businesses and everyone else who relied on local currency for their activities. It hit council very badly that month of May. It started stabilizing mid um, uh, June. And right now we are seeing a slowing down again of the collections in US dollars. People are now used to the ZIG, they are able to pay. I'll now talk about the capital budget. In the first quarter, we only spent 0.2% of our budget in the first quarter. As I mentioned, we didn't have an approved budget. In the second quarter, it went up to 30%, but the overall for, from January to June, we only did 8% capital project. We paid for 8% of our capital projects. I will now move to the back of the second sheet and share with you some of the statistics. You will notice that council, we do bill you for whatever services that you enjoy as, as, as residents of Lawayo. Generally, a bill that comes to people, particularly in your ward, will contain the following elements. You will have a rates charge based on the uh, size of your stand, based on the value of the area you belong to, and also based on a tariff that we apply. Basically, when we charge you rates, uh, uh, dear residents, your rates is basically based on the App and Councils Act, which says I'll charge you in terms of units. I will explain this concept so that all of us can get to know it. Basically, when they were planning, let's say, for this setup, they were saying the stand size that we are approving for this area, maybe it was 1,000 square meters, for example. And then you were fortunate enough to get a stand which was 3,000 square meters and you built your house. But generally, the plan was everything here should be 1,000 square meters. So because you've got a 3,000 square meters, you pay three times than your neighbors. You understand the concept. That's what the Epping Council says. It says you have got three units, whereas anyone who is sitting on a 1,000 square meter has got one unit. So what it then does, it says, what's the general value of properties in this area? So this is done through a valuation rule, which happens once in every 15 years, but this time we were denied an extension of our valuation rule, so we are busy crafting it, very soon we'll be advertising, asking all of you to come and view the valuations of your properties on our valuation role. Please, it's important for you to participate in these exercises. A lot of us, we get shocked with the result instead of getting involved when the thing is being exposed to you for your comments, for your objections. If you object to any valuation of your property, it will have to be resolved internally within council, if it fails, you've got the right to go to an administrative court, which will resolve your issues. I hope I'm clear about that. So what they do, they don't value your property per se, but they value the properties in Malindela to say all of these properties are valued at 70,000. Whether you built a very fancy type of story, we don't care. We are saying all properties in Malindela are valued at 70,000. So what we then do, we multiply your units times the 70,000 times the rate applicable to everyone in Bulawayo. So what differentiates you from people, say, in Makokoba is the value of your property. 
In Makokoba, you might find their values are sitting at 7,000, whereas here in Malindela, the values are sitting at 70,000. People in Pensite, they might have their values sitting at 140,000, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not saying those are the exact figures, but I'm just giving examples. What makes it cheaper to live in Makokoba is because the values of their properties are very low. What makes it expensive for somebody staying in, in Pensite is because the values that have been set for all properties in Pensite are very high. And then the size of your stand then comes into the play. If you've got a very huge stand, the chances you'll find yeah, there is a multiplier of two compared to your neighbor, or, or a multiplier of three and a half compared to your neighbor who has got a multiplier of one. So the size of your stand comes into the picture when we charge your rates. So that's the first thing you see on your bill. The second thing you see on your bill is the fixed water charge. That's universal to everyone who is getting water from cancer. So as long as you are connected to, what, to city council water, we'll charge you a fixed charge for the infrastructure that's there for us to be able to maintain and repair whenever there are pests. We don't come to your area and say, well, there was a pest in your area, please contribute, like what other utilities are saying when there's a theft of a cable. We don't do that. We just come and fix because we have been collecting the fixed charge from residents. Um, it's universal, everyone in Bulawa gets the same charge. Then the third charge that you see on your bill is the water consumption, which is basically based on the meter ratings. I need to admit here, please don't throw eggs and stones at me. I've got a challenge of reading your meters every month. So when I don't read your meters, I simply estimate. In terms of uh, uh, SI 390 of 1981, There's got, we've got a statutory instrument. If you want to write it down, it's SI 390 of 1981. It basically says where you fail to get a reading or you fail to go and read meters, you will estimate. And it tells us how we estimate. It says you take the average of the last three readings and divide by three. You, take, you add the last three consumptions, consumptions, divide by three. This gives you an average that we then uh, bill you on. But if you want to avoid that, you are free to give us your readings. If you feel like you want to, you are not compelled, you can phone the offices and tell them, my reading today is sitting at this. We will use your actual reading that you have phoned in or brought to us. That's your, uh, basically your third charge on your bill. The fourth charge is to do with sewer. If you've got sewer pipes running through your property, collecting your sewer so that we take it to our sewer plants, you will be charged for that infrastructure. There is a fixed charge for sewer, which is the charge number four. And then charge number five is the amount of water you are dumping into the sewer line. Council came up with a 70% to say of the 70% of the water that you are drinking, 70% of it ends up in the what? In the sewers. That was done by some experts who sat down and looked at everything and they told us, in most cases, 70% of the water ends up in the, in the sewer system. We wash our plates, we wash our bodies, we wash our clothing, and the liquid is used to do watering. But if I catch you watering, these days I'll penalize you heavily because of the water shortage. We are unlike Mtare, we Mtare, they tell you, please water as much as you like. Here in Blawa, please don't use council water to water your curtains. We encourage you to use your pole water if we are able to, if you've got a pole. But please, let's conserve the liquid water that we have. So the, this part of the chart, it shows you how much you were owing in the first quarter and how much you were owing in the second quarter. If you look at these figures, you'll notice that domestic consumers are the one who all cancel the most. If you look at both quarters, in the first quarter, domestic consumers owed us almost $441 billion, whereas commercial entities, industry, commerce, and everyone in business were owing us $211 billion. That is in the first quarter. Whereas government, we also supply government with other services, they owe us 56 billion in the first quarter. Now moving to the ZIG period, which is the second quarter, again, domestic consumers owed us the largest amount of money, which is 309 million ZIG, 
And then in the, in the industry and commerce was owing 121 zik, million zik, and government was owing 35 million zik. Okay, we do pursue government. We do disconnect government. We don't just target the residential areas. We do go to government and disconnect them supplies to force them to pay us. Unfortunately, I can't take government to court, <laughs> but I do enforce collection on them. We, we, we do go there, inform them that we are coming to disconnect. Unless you pay for your properties, we will disconnect. We have disconnected the army, the police, the Mlatlanzela buildings. So we are not selective to say we are targeting residential areas only. We are hitting everyone, including industry and commerce. Those who fail to pay, we do the same. Um, I will now move to this part of our presentation. If you look at the bottom there, where it talks about devolution monies. This year, we didn't get any devolution in the first quarter. We only got devolution in the second quarter. That is from April to June. Actually, it came in in June. That's when we got our devolution fund. And we only received 46,000 ZIC dollars from the government on devolution funds. So please, when it comes to us implementing devolution projects, we were just given 46,000 um, ZIC. And if you divide that by 13, you'll find how much it is in US dollars. So this year, that's what we got. But what we did, we shared with you some of the projects that we have implemented as council on the um, devolution funds. We fixed a lot of roads. We fixed a lot of sewer pests. We also built some infrastructure. We also bought pumps to help us pump water into Bulawayo. We also embarked on a school, which we were doing in Caltry Park. It's a sprawling township, but it doesn't have the necessary infrastructure or amenities that are common in other places. So council to use the devolution fund to build a school so that the children there, they can go to their primary schools. Also, what we achieved in the second quarter was the approval of our master plan. Council has yet its master plan approved and it became operational in July. That's when it was gazetted. So the land uses within the city are now in a master plan. If you want to find out how I can use my property currently, what is there on my property that I can do you can visit the master plan. Basically, the master plan is changing some of the uses that you are seeing common in our areas. For example, now, if you are in Sebabs, there is a local plan which says you can undertake commercial activities within Sebabs. We are now allowing it because the master plan has been approved. Prior to this, we couldn't have allowed those activities to happen. So there are certain areas where we've done local plans where if you are able to, you can go and see, instead of me staying in this house, can I change it to a commercial property, get better rentals, and uh, we move forward. I think here you have seen there is an office running here along the road where people come to do their English um, exams, those who want to go to Britain. That's a commercial activity. Why are they doing it in a residential area? It's because the master plan is saying you can do those things. This was also advertised extensively. We had meetings all over the show, and people were free to give their views and objections to this master plan. So what we are working on right now is developing local plans so that people can see in my locality, what can I do that has been taken from the master plan? Are there any things that have changed as far as usage of uh, my property is concerned? I will now turn to this page. We are just sharing with you information to do with employment issues. Council in the first quarter employed 395 people. They became permanent. These were contract workers whom we have been using for quite some time. We changed them from contract workers to permanent staff members. And then in the second quarter, we employed 43 people. These were basically uh, people who are experts in their various fields. Uh, the 395, these were just laborers uh, who we were using all over the show. But in the second quarter, we concentrated on experts that are needed by council. So we only employed 43. 
By the way, for council to employ people, we need to get permission from government, from the Ministry of Local Government. We apply, we tell them this is our shortage of staff members and we need so many people to be employed. It's only when we get that permission from government that we are able to employ. So some of the things that you see council not doing, again, it's affected by the rate at which we employ people. We need to get permission from government. Uh, uh, and added to that is council's uh, packages are not as attractive to attract the right kind of people to work for us. A lot of experts are leaving council for greener pastures and the new ones are not being attracted by our packages. Look at our young engineers, they are all flying out of here. Doctors are all flying out of here. I, I, I can talk of my son-in-law, he was trained as a doctor here. He used to cry to me saying, ah, the package I'm getting is very low. Now he's moved to Britain, he's sitting pretty there. We are losing these people. Council also needs doctors, needs all these experts. But what I'm offering them is not as attractive to keep them, to hold them within cancer. So some of the projects might fail because I need an expert to do this. I'll share with you one experience we had. We are now fixing the lifts at Tower Block. I think most of you were complaining, why is there one lift at Tower Block? So we entered into a contract, somebody is now busy doing that. Then they said, we need a structural engineer. We can't start the work without a structural engineer. We looked within the establishment of council. We don't even have a structural engineer. But then we revisited the contract and the contract said, you, the contractor should look for a structural engineer. Don't worry, council. Go and look for that structural engineer before you start the work. All I'm trying to emphasize here is that we are failing to get the right kind of people to assist us. Those who are still hanging around, they love the city. <laughs> Otherwise, they would have gone. So we have got those challenges. I will now talk about the water side, the water and sewer side. What did we achieve during the first and second quarter? We did a lot of designs for us to fix some of the water challenges that we are facing. For example, we did some designs, some feasibility studies to convert wastewater into, into clear water that can be used by any other industry other than consumption. So they are working on that uh, feasibility study. And then we went on to rehabilitate the Mzingwane poster pump. By the way, council runs five dams. They own five dams. This is upper Nguema, lower Nguema, Mzingwane, where we were fixing a poster pump, which pumps the water to Nguema. And then we have uh, Inyankoni Dam, and then we've got Incisa, or which was called Mayfei before. So we have got those five dams that we own. We also get water from Chavezi, as well as water from Nyamandlovu, from the poles. So at Mzingwane, we needed to repair the, to maintain the poster pump. And then we did a lot of water mains renewals around the city in order to prepare people for water when the water rains come. And then at Incisa, there was an elevated pipe we needed to fix for it to move the water from the dam again to Nguema. All our water comes and enters into Nguema waterworks. From Nguema waterworks, we pump it into Bulawai except the Nyamandlov one. The Nyamandlov one comes from Nyamandlov right up to a reservoir that is in Makwekwe. Otherwise, the rest of the water coming from the dams ends up at Nema, Nema then pumps it into town. The other question that we normally face when we are doing this consultation, they say there's a lot of siltation because they are called panels and everyone there. Those who have visited the dams, they will share with you. I was telling this in another meeting that I think we need to be like Thomas in the Bible, you remember? He said, I want to poke you, Jesus, to make sure this is where the nail went through. Please visit Nema. You're allowed to visit the Thames and see the level of siltation. As far as we're concerned as city council, there is very little siltation that's happening in the Thames, despite the panels being around. There's very minimal silt siltation. Imagine the mechanics of water moving. It moves with all the silt, the sand, and everything else. The moment it enters the dam, it dumps that at the entry point. 
it doesn't move the sand right into the wall dam. That's how water moves and carries the sand around. So if there's any siltation, it's at the mouth of the river where it now enters the peak pot. That's where it dumps the sand. We might have to remove sand there. Uh, and you know what the sand comes with? It comes with gold. So we'll also pan the gold. <laughs> I'm just joking with you. But that's, that's what we, we, we are looking at. So we do get these questions. Why don't you go and remove siltation that is in the Thames? This is what we have seen. A lot of people we have visited, even councillors on Friday, we sent another crew of visitors to go and see the Thames. There's very little siltation to talk about. I will now move on to the water statistics. On average, we abstract from the Thames. In the first quarter, we are abstracting 3,4 million cubic meters of water. And um, we only sold 1,8 million. You can see the difference. We are losing a lot of water there. In the second quarter, we abstracted from the dam 3.1 million cubic meters of water, and we only sold 1.7 million cubic meters. You can see the difference, the loss of water there. We are trying to address those issues. We don't want to lose as much water as Bulawai. We are also sharing with you pictures in the presentation. Uh, it would have been nice if we had electricity, it would have been to them. We are showing all the things that council is doing. We are also showing you a picture there where we are fixing the incisor, sorry, the Nyankoni pump station. We need to uh, change the pumps at that place. So we are busy fixing the pumps. We are doing it in the first and second quarter in order to improve supplies to Bulawayo. Above that picture you are seeing down there, there is a table and a bar chart. We are showing you the level of pests that are happening. Ladies and gentlemen, the pests are exacerbated by the water shedding. The pipe system was never meant to run dry. It was meant to continuously have water. The moment you run it dry and recharge it, you are creating unnecessary pressures in the pipes, and it leads to them being pesting all over the shore. We are praying as much as we can that we have got good rains so that we keep those pipelines charged. Otherwise, if we keep on fluctuating, there's water, no water, water, no water, those pipes will burst and we will have many pests. That's why we're showing you all these statistics of how many pests we attended to. So these are some of the things that we thought we should make you aware of. What. And then if you come this side, we are just showing you some of the things that we're doing. That's a clarifier that we're showing on this picture. Uh, it's where your water is then purified. It's at Nema, this one. Uh, water comes with all the mud and everything else. We add aluminum sulfate to it to allow that debt to coagulate. Like a person who pours uh, a lemon in milk, the milk coagulates and then it starts separating. We do the same with water. We put aluminum sulfate to speed up the coagulation of those particles that are in the water so that they circle down on the water. So when it circles, you can see in this clarifier, at the bottom, there's something like a, 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 a sweeping broom where all the mud that is circled is swept into some intake which throws the mud out of the system. The clean water remains at the top and we continue with our processing of the water. I will now move you to our social services. We had a campaign of uh, um, on our children who were younger than 10 years on polio. We went around, we had identified the population and we said, let's go into these three areas and um, immunize the children. What we then discovered, we achieved more than what we had targeted. We were thinking we'll get 10 children. When we get there, we find there are 15. So if you look at the percentages that are shown on this particular bar chart, we were achieving more than we had targeted on this bar chart. Again, we would like to appreciate the gift that we got from the Egyptian embassy. They supported us on medication. And then we are also showing you the pharmacies that we are building in most of our local cleans, clinics. Council has got a number of clinics, I think in, in excess of 23 or 25 clinics, if I'm not wrong. We are building pharmacies. So far, we have built seven pharmacies. The whole idea is when you come to a clinic, you should get also your medication from the same clinic. So we are putting up these pharmacies. Instead of writing a little note to go to a pharmacy elsewhere to buy your medication, we are saying, why not make it a one-stop place 
where you get your, your help. In the eastern suburbs, this side of town, council runs about two clinics. We've got one in Darkmoor, in, uh, sorry, in um, Balm Green, which is called uh, the Balm Green Clinic. And then we've got one at uh, Princess Margaret uh, Preschool, you see along Barrow Street. That's where we've got another one there. So those are the two. The planners believed that people in this side are affluent enough to go and uh, get healed in the doctor's surgeries, whereas in townships where they were struggling, we built more clinics for them. I will now move on to uh, this part of the presentation because we are now getting a little bit darker. Council pioneered a program that has been copied by other local authorities. We were running short of uh, refuse removal trucks. So what council then did, he said, we are seeing a lot of these trucks parked around. People have got trucks that are parked around. They are not doing any business. Why not enter into a business contract with council? If you've got a truck of a right size, come to us. We'll enter into a contract. We'll give you an area where you collect and council will pay you. You won't collect from the residents. We will pay you. We will do the collection from the residents. So what you're seeing there, we call them com community trackers. They collect refuse on behalf of council. We are using them extensively in the high density areas as well as some parts of the city center. We do send them if our trucks are down to collect the garbage. Let's move on to the issue of uh, stands. There are some in the audience who might want a piece of land to build a home, a house. We are showing you the statistics of 7,717 stands that we are currently developing in various parts of the city and the level of the development that we have done so far in, in servicing the land so that others can also get a piece of land to build their homes. Um, I will move on to other issues that we are doing. I'll concentrate on the pictures. Council has been building a school, as I mentioned, Volindlela using devolution funds. We were also building um, the ECT blocks on our council schools. We own the schools, we run the schools, but the teaching staff and the headmaster come from the Minister of Education. We don't employ those. They are paid by government but the infrastructure is city council. It's your infrastructure as residents. That's what we run. We only offer them, council pays for the PESA as well as the caretaker of that place. So we needed to do some ECT blocks. This is the new thing that's coming. Children need to be at school at a tender age and they go through the whole system. When we were growing in our townships, we used to call them crash. And these days they call them preschools. <laughs> but council is now having its own preschool in the form of a ECT block. So we have to build these blocks, but we don't necessarily use our money. I need to emphasize that. We talk to the parents, we have children in that particular school to buy the material and everything else. Council then comes in with the technical aspects of the construction. So much of it is funded by parents and they are happy to do so, so that their children can have a place to learn. I will now move to one, council runs just one secondary school. I think we've got close to 29 primary schools scattered throughout the town, and we've got just one secondary school. This school is located in some remote part of the city. We call it St. Peter's uh, Methodist Village. This is an isolated part of city of Blawai. The children were walking long distances to come to Pomula for their secondary education. So council went and built a school there. Then what happened is that the teachers were saying, we are also walking the same long distance because we disembark in Pomula and we have to walk through the bush to get to the secondary school. So what council then decided, let's put accommodation at the school so that you don't cry about the distances yet traveling. So those children were suffering because the teachers will end earlier to go back home. They'll come late. So the time there to the children was very limited. So what council then said, we will put the accommodation for you teachers so that you can give full-time attention to the students in that secondary school. 
We also are renovating our own community walls. We have done Makwekwe, which you are seeing in the picture. We have done a hall in Luveve. We have been doing halls all over the show. And what council has also done is to promote um, entrepreneurship among its residents. So we do run some fair where the residents come and display what they've done. It's not the trade fair, but it's a separate fair where anyone can come and display what they are doing in their houses to earn a living and continue enjoying the city of flowers. So it's a series of pictures we are showing where council calls them, come and uh, market yourself. You never know, you might get some more interest in your product from other people. Um, and then I think those who, like me, I have to jump into a Honda Fit to get home sometimes. We did a Cotini so that these commuter uh, taxis have a decent place to, do, to, 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 to operate from. So we have done phase A, 1A. We are now moving to phase 1B of the development of Ecotin. So don't assume that we are done with Ecotin. We are still moving with Ecotin to the next phases. I will also move on to some of the amenities and social activities we do as council. We have an, a program that we are running with the youth where we are calling the youth to respond to climate issues. So we went to Pomula, gathered all the youth, and told them that there is a program where you can be funded if you go into climate issues. So this was the response we are seeing. All those youth came to see how they can also join in and get funding on issues related to environmental issues, climate issues. These are some of the things that we have done. We do train children who come from all diverse places. We've got our vocational training centers. What do we train them? We train them on building motor mechanics. We train them on beauty therapy. We train them on hotel and catering. We train them on dressmaking. We train them on electrical household, electrical wiring. These kids come without any O levels. We don't demand O levels. Because if we start doing that, we are now saying, those without all levels, where will they go? So council basically said, if you don't have all levels, come to our vocational, we'll train you. At the end of the day, you are a useful member of the society. We are trying to get you out of drugs by training you on various activities. So we are showing you on this particular pictures, this cottage of pictures, some of the trainings that we undertake. We also were involved in a lot of uh, civil, ac civic activities, like um, the, the arts festival we had in June, as well as um, the cycling, which you see the pictures where our esteemed mayor cycled as well. We took him pictures while cycling. We are promoting good health within the citizens of Zimbabwe. When I grew up as a young boy in Mzilikazi Township, we knew that our parents would be coming down the flyover in bicycles going to work. In the evening, there would be another whole lot of them going back to work. That's how we grew up. But these uh, combis and um, shiga shigas took away that zeal for us to cycle and exercise. Um, I will now move on to to the next, where the mayor is, the pictures are down there. You can see the mayor cycling there. All right, let's move on to the next page of our presentation. We were also fixing roads. There is a wall table that shows you the roads that we attended to in the first and second quarter, as well as sprucing up where people do their marketing along Fifth Avenue. It was a mess. We had to chase all of them away, and then we had to redo the roads. Fife Avenue from PSS, that is uh, Joshua Mkabugongkomo Road, going all down the way to Robert Mkabe Way. We did that road. In addition, we then went and did George Lundiga as well. 
We discovered it was full of potholes in the city centre. If you go now, that road looks very nice. We want to expand those programmes within the city centre to allow people to, to move freely and uh, move on trafficable roads. Um, I will move on. You can read more. I, I don't want to waste your time going through something you can read at home, but I will pick the highlights. We also are concerned with the environment. We developed parks all over the show. We've got the Centenary Park and other parks scattered all over the show. So what council did, it wanted to plant more trees. We wanted to plant quite a lot of trees. Our target was to plant 1,250 trees the whole year. By the second quarter, we had only planted 377 trees. Why we want to make the city look more greener and more pleasant to live in. So we are seized with that activity where we have a target of planting 1,250 trees. We are showing you the National Tree Planting Days, the activities we participated in on the National Tree Planting Day. And also the parks that we titivated, if you look at the very last page, it shows one of the parks that we titivated in the western areas. It was quite dry, we had to go there and start titivating the park. We are also titivating our stadiums. Blauer City Council has got three stadiums that it runs, it owns. We've got the big one, Papa Field Stadium, and then we've got what we call White City Stadium, and then the last one is called Luveve Stadium. Those are our stadiums. Periodically, we need to keep them in good condition so that any games, international games that might come, they find us ready to host some of these activities. So, Again, still on environment, we are busy running around chasing people who are destroying the environment. If you look at the last page, we impounded a vehicle which was busy uh, digging pit sand in one of our areas. Imagine if they keep digging these pits all over the show. That land is now useless. I can't use it. If I want to use it, I will need to go on a massive, expensive exercise of flattening it out and then using it. So what we are doing, we are intensifying our activities of making sure that the environment is protected. We arrest those we find doing illegal activities, cutting trees. By the way, uh, you don't cut a tree which is in the street. I, I need to highlight that. Even if it's affecting your house, you don't cut it. You have to come and apply to council to say this tree is interfering with my property. Why? It's because we want to keep the city green. If we allow you, you flatten all trees in town and take it for firewood. <laughs> so we are trying to make sure our environment is kept as green as possible. And these are some of the activities that we have done. I, I, I tried to summarize this as much as possible so that we allow you time to ask questions. Um, I will now hand you over to our esteemed mayor to continue with the program. Put questions to have your say if you've got particular proposals. I know some of you have regarding sports clubs. Um, Just passing on some questions from other residents. Um, one is about TTI. Um, clamping in areas where there are no road markings to indicate the spaces. Um, another question is about lines being painted on the Joburg Road, especially from Ascot to Cecil Avenue. There are no markings whatsoever and it's dangerous, especially at the UBH turnoff. Um, and three is the quality of pothole repairs. They disintegrate soon afterwards. Um, and asking if council is doing inspections. Um, quality control and it can only uh, clamp in terms of of those regulations what I encourage residents to do those regulations are available um, they should be available online uh, because they've been published recently get to know them and if you are clamped in circumstances that are not prescribed in those regulations then you, you, you have the right to object and lodge a formal complaint with us. I, I need to say that TTI is a work in progress um, in, in that we had lawlessness in, in the city for a long time and it was necessary to restore order. The previous council entered into a contract with 
TTI. Uh, it, in some respects, I think is, has been implemented overzealously, but we are constantly in touch with TTI. What we need to do is get uh, complaints from you and then we try to address it. But I stress it is a work in progress. I'm not justifying what they have done, uh, but do let us know if, if your rights are violated in, in terms. They are not allowed to clamp, as I say, I stress, in circumstances not specifically set out in, in those regulations. Um, it was TTI. Um, painted lines on the Johannesburg Yeah. Uh, okay. So you might have seen that our roads department has been painting roads right across the city. Uh, they have improved many of our roads, but, but obviously there are roads that have not been addressed. Um, in our chair's coordination meeting this afternoon, the, the reason I was late for this meeting, because we met all this afternoon, uh, we discussed specifically the Johannesburg Road, which is in a terrible state, not just regarding painting, but also, of course, because of the dilapidation of, of the road. So uh, Johannesburg Road is a focus of ours, and, and hopefully we will get round to paint s shortly. And the third one? Yeah. Um, let me speak about roads. This city used to get revenue from um, license, car license fees back in the day. And it provided the city with a very steady and large stream of cash that was then used to maintain our roads. Government, in its wisdom, changed that policy and centralized everything to um, Zenara. Uh, and all that money goes to, to Harare, and we have to pretty much beg to get money back. Last year, we got back 800,000. We uh, need a minimum of around about 15 million just to maintain our existing road network. Uh, we got 800,000 back, and of course the sting in the tail was it wasn't paid in US dollars, it was paid in Zimbabwe dollars, so it evaporated. So we have a major problem uh, regarding roads to, to try and adequately maintain roads. And, and so, Sarah, what you say is, is correct. Our, our roads department try to do the, the best they can. But in terms of my own priorities, my priorities are water, sanitation, and sorting out the informal sector. Uh, I confess to you that roads are, are not top of our priority because basically they don't kill people uh, in the same numbers as people uh, dying of thirst if we run out of water, to put it in context, man. I, I, people do die, die from bad roads, but not in the same numbers. Rob. So everything being pointed out and you are tackling all the different tasks, and I congratulate you since you've taken over on, on the changes in Bulawa. <coughs> the glaring standout thing is the difference between billing and receipts and it's not enough it's not a positive trend yet i hope there'd be a lot more effort put into that i think it's speak for all residents in that but i really want to say that what you're doing is fantastic it's a good start with, with all the shackles that government have put on you but on a cultural level um Bulawa has a lot of sports clubs that are really really struggling because of rate spills. There's a sports club up the road here that offers squash, tennis, golf, uh, darts, and is a social club, that they have to have 100 members just to pay the rates, to put into context. They've got 160 members. 100 members' contributions, if they paid up, that only pays the rates. Um, and I know most of the sports clubs are really crying about the backlog of their rates. Perhaps the City Fathers can look at that and be a lot more sympathetic towards sports clubs. As, as explained, we are owed a lot of money from ratepayers. Um, we are owed money by government and uh, quite frankly the finances are on a knife edge in terms of, of rates. But I, I think that there are not that many sports clubs in, in, in the city, we would need to have a look, Mr. Mpunzi, at the, at the impact 
of a rates reduction in terms of our, our, our gross budget. So my, my encouragement to you is, it, regarding the, the sports clubs that you know of, get them to write to us to, to make the case. Um, I'm, I'm not aware since I became, came into office of sports clubs who have indicated what their rates bills are, how many members they've got, what their overall expenses are, and made the case for a rate, rates reduction. It's just been a, more of a sort of general plea, uh, but do that. Let me touch on your first point, um, the reconciliation of payments to um, a, accounts. It's another issue that we discussed this afternoon. What we are actively working on is to make our accounts available online so that uh, every single ratepayer can go onto the website and check their individual account to see the, the, the charges that have been raised, to check that their payments are, are, are properly credited. And uh, Mr. Mpunzi has given me an assurance that that, we, we hope, will be at, at least ready for testing by the end of August, but we are actively working towards that. We are, we are also working to, towards improving the online payment system so that you can pay online. Uh, but that, that is a work in progress because different banks have different requirements. Finally, on, on rates, I trust that you've all seen the opening of the office at Trade Fair. Uh, I encourage you to use that office. Those who have used it uh, report that it's much quicker and much easier for those uh, who, who live in, in Ward 4. Okay. No TTIs. And no TTI. Yeah. Ma'am. Uh, I want to know when information will be available, when we can go and check the new rates. Isn't it there's going to be an evaluation? Uh, when will it be available, the information? Mr. Mpunzi, would you like to respond to that? So, given the fact that there's a new valuation taking place, when will residents be able to check what their valuation is and how it impacts their rates account? The exercise is still ongoing. It's work in progress. Once it's finished, an advert will be placed in the media encouraging people to visit our offices. The handling of the exercise falls under the mandate of the town planning department. And they are on ninth floor, tower block. Sorry? No, they... <laughs> we, we are just on that. Um, we have started Okay. Repair of the lifts in Tower Block, yeah. and I'm assured by the end of the year. Yes, yeah, about the, the lifts will be working. Six of them are operational. Okay. Yes. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Maybe a, a, a comment on on our data. What for is supporting the city in terms of receipts? I have an opportunity to to carry out an analysis. In terms of ranking, yes, you rank number four in terms of owing, which is not bad. But you are owing this as at the end of April, end of April, you were owing the city about 25 million zik. So what does that mean? It means we are literally providing services for free. Because when I analyzed a month, we bill you close to 13.5. So that translates to two months free use of PCC services. Are we, are we doing justice to, to the city? What does it mean to the industry or to the suppliers that provide PCC with material to your employees? The presenter said uh, we are losing skilled employees. It's because we are not paying them <clears throat> enough. So my encouragement is that probably we at least make an effort to service our, our bills. 
Remember, for us to provide a service, we need to buy uh, water chemicals, we need to collect garbage, and also buy uh, space from suppliers. If we, f we take long to, to pay for the services that we acquire from the suppliers, we are killing the industry. So we need to balance the issues. The private uh, developed uh, area stands, whereby now the residents are paying rates, but it looks like the council is uh, not showing much concern on those areas in the form of development and even policing the areas. You find that there are lots of stands that are not occupied and they've turned into bushes and some of them are occupied by uh, maybe illegal residents, if I can say that, and they are occupying them with no toilets and no water. So for these guys, they use the bush uh, for their toilets and for the water, they benefit from leaking pipes. So they always try to, we suspect they always try to make sure there is a leaking pipe somewhere for them to get water. On, on the heights, there, there is a, basically a dispute between the city council and the developer. In terms of the development permit, uh, the developer was meant to construct roads and sewerage and, and the like and has not complied with that development permit. So that falls outside of the jurisdiction of, of the city council. Um, and th there is an ongoing uh, discussion with with the developer to, to get those roads properly tarred and, and, and the sewerage. In the areas, in the high density suburbs, we are aware that the, the, there is an issue with some residents who entered into an agreement with, uh, with the council to purchase stands. Um, and unfortunately, midway through those agreements, government changed from US dollars to Zimbabwe dollars, which uh, has, seriously disrupted uh, the, those programs uh, because the money that had been paid to the council was converted into Zimbabwe dollars and evaporated. And so that money, which previously had been in hard currency, which was earmarked to develop those, those stands, uh, which was the council's responsibility, is, is simply not there. Uh, we have not resolved those, those issues. It is one of, believe you me, <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, hundreds of issues on, on my plate at, at present, but I am conscious of it. Let me just use this opportunity to explain from a, a personal perspective. I knew that this was going to be a poison chalice when I came into office, uh, but I didn't fully appreciate the breadth or depth of the problems that the city faces. And in the last year, what I've had to do in conjunction with my colleagues is work out what are the priority areas. We, as I say, have a, a wide array of problems, and Mr. Mpunzi has spoken about the problems that we face in not receiving money. And, and it's a vicious uh, cycle, because we don't, we don't have money, so we're not be able to uh, provide services so people say, well, you haven't provided services, so I'm not going to pay rates. And, and, and it just exacerbates the problem. But th this affects every single aspect of, of council operations. I've come down to three critical areas. Firstly, water. We face uh, an absolute catastrophe uh, as, a, as a city. Our dams at present are 31% full. Um, we've had these high temperatures in July, uh, which are seeing uh, higher evaporation levels that, than we have ever experienced. It is compounded by gold panning, and whilst I take what my colleague has said about silt not actually getting into the dams themselves, what gold panning has done is it has clogged our river systems before the water can even get to our dams. And if you don't believe me, go... Uh, just drive south of Criterion and you can see the illegal mining that is taking place there, literally digging up river systems so the water never gets. So we, we have a major crisis uh, which could turn into an absolute catastrophe. We do have plans. We have short-term plans. 
to rehabilitate systems so that we can access the water which we do have in the two remaining dams, in Caesar and in Chabez. Virtually all the other dams will be uh, decommissioned in the course of the, few, the, the next few months. But we do have short-term plans to access water to Incisa and Mchabez. We are not going to run out of water, but we are going to see uh, in, in the run-up to, to the rainy season, unfortunately, even further uh, water cuts. It's just a, a function of not having sufficient raw water. But that's our short-term plan to make sure that we can at least access where we do have, have water. Our medium-term plan is we have um, resuscitated a 1988 proposal to build glass block ore. It's also called Popoma Dam near Mbalabala. Um, this dam should have been built decades ago. It has not been built, um, and we're working very closely with uh, a private consortium and government uh, to get work started on, on that dam. When that dam uh, is completed, it is literally a, a game changer. We need about 165 megaliters of water a day. That dam alone will generate rain, of course, has to come, but let's assume that we get rain into it. Uh, that, that, that dam alone will generate 70 megaliters per day. So you will see it's a complete game, cha game changer. In the long term, we're reliant on Gua Shangani but we will only need Gua Shangani water in 2040 once glass block dam. So that's, our, that's my number one priority. If you speak to our staff, our fellow councillors, I, I just speak water, 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 because without water we die. Number two is sanitation and uh, general cleansing. Our eight sewerage plants are, are working way below capacity, less than 20% capacity. And so a lot of our focus is on rehabilitating the sewerage plants. And then tied to that, of course, is the general clean, cleanliness of the city. And I hope that you've seen an improvement in collection of garbage and the tidying up of, of cities. And then ultimately, part of that project is to get a, a new waste management uh, scheme uh, going whereby we can give value to plastic and ensure that Plastic doesn't clog our roads and our, our rivers, and we reprocess it. That's number two. Number three is to restore law and order in the city, in particular uh, in relation to informal vendors. Those of you who've got businesses in the, the center of the city, in Fifth Avenue, know how informal vendors have clogged the city center. Um, we understand why people have gone there, because they're desperate but we are working on a series of markets, uh, attractive markets, starting with Egodini, to attract those uh, vendors out of the city center and then progressively try to restore law and order in every facet, not just in, in vending. Uh, you will see down here that we've, we've put rocks where people had made their own roads. Uh, we had people cutting their own roads onto Hillside Road very dangerously and vehicles driving onto Hillside Road uh, where no one was expecting them. And so right across the city, progressively, we're trying to restore the rule of law. We, we're trying to ensure that our bylaws are, are respected to restore sanity to the city. So those are our three primary objectives. Yes, we, we need to deal with our schools and our clinics and our roads, but our focus is on those three areas to provide a, a basis to take the city forward. Uh, we can two parts. Firstly, you're talking about changes in land use planning and what we can do in our areas. How does that affect in terms of rates? Because once an area is deemed as commercial, it affects the rates. And looking at the demographic here, we've got a lot of pensioners. How will that affect the rates? And then secondly, as we build on to that, the issue has always been with collection versus billing has been the fact that people just cannot afford. And billing has, instead of trying to look at creative ways of getting those who aren't paying to pay, it's actually been increasing the burden on those who are paying by increasing the charge. How will these new valuations actually help in increase collections without further burdening those who are paying the little they can? Okay.
Now, we've just recently, this past week, I signed off on the new master plan. It is available. It, it, it will become a public document so that people can see and, uh, and identify in terms of the new master plan what is designated for commercial and, and what isn't. The property, currently we have this situation all over our area. You, you are seeing there's a, there's a, a lodge next to the shops, right? What we do to those areas, we say, you, if you want to develop a lodge or a commercial activity, you will load your property with an extra charge called the development levy, which doesn't affect the rest of the other properties. You following me? So your rates, the neighbors, will not be affected because your neighbor now is engaging in commercial activities. At the moment, that lodge, if you ask them, they are not paying domestic rates. We have also loaded on the domestic rates a levy to recognize that is also engaged in what? In commercial activities. That's what we do. That's the simple solution to it. We won't then go throw out the whole step up unless, unless we totally say the whole area now is commercial. Then we are telling you now it's time for you to move. But what we are saying in the current master plan is that when we develop the local plans and say you are free now to do commercial activities, we won't affect your rates because you are still zoned as a residential area, which we are now allowing commercial activities. So anyone who says, I want my property to now move into commercial activities, we will load him with the extra charge, what we call develop development levy. Thank you. Thank you. The the city council has been the victim of national poli policies. And we were obliged to comply, which most businesses do not comply with, let it be said, in allowing people to pay in Zimbabwe dollars. And rates were set at US dollars. Historically, that was converted to, to one to one. And, and naturally, people uh, preferred to pay the, their rates uh, at the official rate of exchange, which bore no resemblance to the real rate of exchange. And the, the, the city bled as a result, because we were, most people, and it's, in, I stress, entirely logical. You, you're going to pay the cheapest method of paying your rates. So if you can pay at the official rate of exchange, the only way that the council could respond to that was by increasing the US dollar component. And that is why the US dollar component has gone up by a much higher percentage than the US dollar rate of inflation, because you had this distortion. I recently explained to the, um, the, the Chamber of Industry this, this point, that hopefully if there is stability in ZIG, there can be a review of the rates that, that are charged. But for so long as the council is obliged to take payment at the official rate, we have to protect ourselves by, by having this relatively high rate of, of US dollar rates, which have gone up dramatically since government decided to abandon the US dollars. And, and that's the reason why. I'm afraid it's not a very satisfactory answer, ma'am. Uh, you know, your, 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 your point is well taken. When, when you look at the US dollar uh, figure for, for rates, it has gone up way above the, the US dollar rate of inflation, but that's the reason why. We hope that there'll be stability. Land use. Yeah. Has this now gone on to residential areas being industrial areas? Have you looked at the impact of noise and the impact of that on roads? If you just travel along Stratford into Hampshire, into uh, Lang uh, uh, Langston, you will look, you'll see the impact that I'm talking about. And how does this now affect even the devolution of funds into uh, portables and whatever? Because it seems as if some people are now taking advantage of uh, changes and it's industrial and it's heavy trucks where our roads uh, made to uh, 
sustain those heavy trucks as well. The plan to keep residential areas separate from industrial areas persists. What I recommend, and this is a preliminary response to what you're saying, ma'am, is if you are concerned about rezoning, you, you have a right to see the master plan to see what is happening in, in, in the area where you live in or areas that you're concerned about. Turning to the second aspect, that of the, the destruction of roads, um, I, I think that there's been deterioration of roads right across the city for the simple reason that these roads have gone way beyond their expected economic life, lifespan. Uh, so it's not necessarily the case that roads are being destroyed by heavy trucks. Funny enough, I, this morning I was interviewed by Trevin Mube, uh, who came down from Harare, the, the head of Alpha Media. And he was explaining to me the destruction of Harare roads because uh, although Harare has got lots of raw water, they have even worse water delivery than we do. There are many places, many suburbs in Harare that haven't seen water in years. And, and what that has resulted in is uh, a massive explosion in the number of businesses trucking in borehole water. And it's, apparently it's absolutely destroying uh, Harare's roads. So we do have that to a certain extent, heavy uh, trucks with water. But just be assured that we're working as hard as we can to restore dignity to our city, and we'll keep doing so. Thank you. Ray, just to explain this, um, a few years ago, uh, Council passed a, uh, a policy that to ensure equity in the spending of ratepayers' monies, a portion of the ratepayers' monies paid into the central coffers of the City Council would be returned to the, the ward concerned. And for residents' associations to use that money uh, in, in the best interests of, of the ward. Now, obviously, it's, it's quite a task trying to get a consensus with residents how they, they want to use their money. And we are just starting that process in Ward 4. Ward 5 has, is more advanced than, than Ward 4. They have already achieved a consensus in their ward that they want to use the money uh, on uh, the purchase of streetlights. Uh, we, as I say, are just starting that process. Uh, I've recently been advised that a figure of 70,000 US is available. It's not a vast amount of money. Um, and we're starting this process of consultation, just hearing from residents uh, how they would like us to spend that money. There are two broad proposals that have come forward to date. The first is to do what we've done in Ward 5, to uh, repair streetlights along the main roads in, in the ward. Um, the other is a proposal to rehabilitate all the um, drains and ditches which feed into Hillside Dam uh, to en enhance the uh, capacity of, of the dam, of the water catchment area for, for Hillside Dam. Um, in, in some respects, that is a preferable uh, proposal, in my view, in that it would entail the employment of a lot of unemployed young people to come and dig up the, the drains and to open them up so that when it rains, whatever rain comes to us will find its way into Upper Hillside Dam. But um, we're just starting. We, we don't have time tonight. Uh, but I'm just advising you that this process is beginning. If you've got particular ideas, please let me know. Um, my email uh, inbox is already clogged. So I'll give you my email <laughs> address. If you, if you want to write to me with your ideas, my email address is davidcoltart at gmail.com. And let me have your, uh, your suggestions. It's dark. Um, I, I think that we need to wrap up. I'm sorry. We hope that there would be power. Uh, we didn't choose a venue that had an alternative power source, which we need to address next time. But I think that we do need to, to wrap up unless there are any pressing points or, or questions.
A very good morning to you guys. Welcome to Asake Online. My name is Bright Tung. We'll be coming live uh, from Ward 17, Las Ropes, in Yoka Village, uh, here to get to know this ward and different problems faced by people from this ward. And joining me to unpick that is none other than by the councillor for this ward in 17, that's councillor's colleague, Moyo, uh, to help me understand uh, this ward and what happens in this ward. Good morning to you, councillor. Good morning. Let's talk about this ward. Today we're coming live from Ropes, in Yoka Village, but there's other side of Pomola there. How, how long, how big is this ward? Ward 17 is the biggest ward, if I may say. Uh, we have uh, Pumula North, we have Pumula South Phase 3, Robert Snyoga Village, we have uh, Mazwi Village, we have St. Peter's Village, we have Methodist, and we have uh, some plots, downstill plots, along Solus Road. So this comprises of Ward 17. But also, speaking of this peri urban area and also a Pumula where this not an urban area, right? How do you balance that as a councillor for those these areas are different? Peri urban where my villagers, Glencoma, and so on, I say, look, how do you balance as a councillor to have two areas are different but in one word? Uh, as a councillor, I have to balance because we stay in the same community, we share almost the same resources, we share. Uh, same pipes of water, maybe if I can put it that way. Sihlalanda wonye se sitwa elene uguti singabantu banye indu woze tu se zifanana. Ngapa sile nkomo, sile mbuzi, siya tipisi nkomo ngama Wednesday. E pumula no tingale, siya biskala ngama suwa. E, ama pipes e, tuwa inda wezi nengi, e, iza kami zizikala nga masuwa, ogunye imp, ama pipes e, tuwa sema dala, e, gwezi inda o ize esa ya kimba function of pumping electricity, i pump e tuwa isa sebe nzi, so uya tolu kutive la masuwa as tuwa lisenzi. So maslele mtlanga nweni, siya gunanzelelu kuti, siya kangelu kuti, si tlanga nisi zikala zoze tu, as one community. Ungabuza uche ya menewe Robert Snyoga uya nelisu ukasuse ilama problems wa sepo mula nuthu. Because leadership yetu siya inanzele lisu uti siya iye siya ifundisu uti pe kwa zuko nko kwenza galaya. Because iko ukone delimitation is nige kona loko. But before delimitation, was this word like this or now by enter more areas to your word? Was it like this before delimitation? Before delimitation besi ngela phase 3 pumula south. EATA Pumula South because the uh, numbers uh, of people that are registered were uh, a bit below. Baseven Gezelela in phase three Pumula South. Ogubanzi, Mangoban also Cassa Selaba Sali. We are Chelumuntu towards seventeen Kalise Pumula North, Uldu, Le Pumula, Old Dre Kalisel and Allegro at nineteen, Ube Le Pumula, Kubeso continue over what seventeen. Owen Zabantu Benga was with Suguti, a Gantigua, and Nan Utiba Tati Pumula old as a two Pumula no. So those are some of the challenges because Laming in Cancella, so meling even mobile, in overhanging a comopile, I cannot reach all corners of your word. Uh -huh. But also, how do you communicate with people saying it's a big word? How do you reach all those people in terms of uh, mobilizing your meetings? How do you reach and communicate to all those people? There is leadership in all the areas. I've clustered them into Pumula South. There is leadership. There are five sections. Gulama committees are five. Pumula North, there are six sections. Gulama community, Gulama chairpersons, Ama section are six. Ama villages, Gulama village development committees. At the same time, Futi among us, the Ward Gulama Residents Association, I have three of them. Gule, Wibulawe Progressive Resident Association, Kubele, Wibulawe United Residents Association. Resident Association, the Mtokas Resident Association. So, I was able to get to the community and the communication here to Hambanja. I'm looking at the toilet behind us here. It's a solar power tower light. It was one of your initiatives. And today we're coming live from this ground, also one of your initiatives in the area of Sinyoka. Talk to us more about how this initiative of toilets came about. Uh, this initiative of tower lights, of solar lights, came about with the community of Robert Sinyoga. Uh, when we discussed with the community, 